If you have YouTube open, uh, you need to turn off YouTube's, uh, those who are on Zoom, YouTube's uh, microphone, uh, uh, speaker, please. Um, peace be on you. Salamun uh, alaikum. 27th of February, 2021. Uh, this is Adib. I have a few uh, friends join me right now. Uh, later with time, I will be also given the Zoom link. Uh, I will share it with the chat. There is live chat right now going and I will be watching the live chat also. Hold on. Okay. Um, we are right now we are meeting uh, because of Saudi government's uh, recent uh, okay hold on hold on hold on this is something we have too many things going on here um, uh, can't talk now uh, I need to turn off my uh, phone I apologize for that there are too many phones coming here right now uh, I am in in Iowa, people, uh, we have a, a startup, technology startup, and uh, therefore I moved to Iowa to work on uh, uh, on prototype. Okay, someone is making noise. I need to. It's Ilava Haber, USA. Ilava Haber. Okay. Please mute yourself, Ilava Haber. Uh, Okay, I did mute uh, now my Gregory. Okay, that will be a major issue right now. People come in here. Let me check. Okay, unmute themselves. I'm not going to permission to unmute themselves. <laughs> I declare authoritarian regime right now because I am not much uh, capable, talented to moderate while talking. And uh, therefore, uh, I will do that. It, the easiest way of to govern a country or uh, doing something like this is to be authoritarian. Unfortunately, I chose the easiest path. Um, <laughs> forgive me. But uh, soon I will change this one. Let me a little bit. Uh, I have been participating in many meetings, business meetings since early morning. At four hours, we have been on Zoom and stuff. Therefore, mentally, I'm busy. But uh, here is the issue, uh, people. Uh, let me see. Uh, is uh, Hassan, uh, uh, Hassan Farhan al-Maliki. He has been tried in Saudi Arabia. And uh, he's well known for his promotion of Quran alone, uh, reforming in religion. Uh, turning to Islam, the system of peace, instead of Sunni or Shiite religions, which are corrupt, which are the enemies of the peacemaking or rational monotheism. And, uh, but he is not the first nor the last person who has been oppressed, who has been threatened, and uh, who has been tried to be killed by the murderous Saudi regime. I call it Saudi barbaria. It has got away with a lot of atrocities in the last century. And it's very oppressive, repressive, misogynistic country. Unfortunately, Saudi Arabia gets away with all these atrocities. In fact, recently killed hundreds of thousands of people in Yemen, bombed civilians. It's a bloody regime. And they got away with it because it is supported by corrupt United States government. And uh, we have to pressure the United States for not supporting these killers, these murderers. Um, Saudi Arabia is, is basically is a dark uh, country. And uh, of course, it's not alone. Unfortunately, China is doing a lot of atrocities against the Turkish minority there, the Uyghur Turks, they have been in camps 
uh, and uh, in co concentration camps, uh, forced uh, assimilation. And uh, all we have, uh, we know a lot of atrocities, oppression in Iran, and the, in even India against Muslim minority, though there are several hundred millions, but still they are minority there. And in Rohingya, we know that uh, Buddhist monks and uh, they butchered Muslims. And in Turkey, we know Kurdish minority is, has been under uh, very oppressive racist fascist regime. And in Iraq, we know what happened. Um, therefore, uh, Saudi Arabia is not the only country with so much human rights violations. However, it gets a lot of support and it gets away with a lot of impunity. And that, and also does this kind of uh, oppression and atrocity, commit those atrocities in the name of God, it uses God. In our China is not using God at least, it's not sanctifying this in the name of God. You know, you can hurt another person. Yes, it is a crime. But if you are hurting another person, if you are oppressing women or killing human beings, innocent humans, in the name of God, it is the zenith of aggression. It is the worst crime you can commit because you are not, you know, as someone who commits crime, yes, is criminal. Uh, tacitly, implicitly, it is known. But if that person is also proud of his crime or her crime, that is cannot be accepted at all because there is no way to correct it. And uh, there is no way for that person or that government uh, with regret. Now, I want to share with you a few things before starting. Let me see what I have here. Goodness sake. Um, Okay, I need to open the page. There is a uh, problem with this sharing. Um, okay, here. Okay, oh, this is MNC International. Um, about Saudi Arabia 2019, it is report about Saudi Arabia. And uh, the Shia minority is under a lot of oppression there. In Iran, uh, Turkmen or atheists or those people who want to live their lives, they are under oppression. Uh, please. Uh, and uh, here is, I want you to browse it later. Those who watch this one, I will not go. Uh, okay, freedom of expression, association, assembly. There is no freedom of expression. You cannot criticize the murderers, biggest thieves in the country, which they are princes and uh, the kings in that country. They are the biggest thieves and terrorists, basically. And if you criticize them, you end up uh, penalized. And... Uh, these are human rights, uh, even activists, they are targeted. Here are the names of some. And uh, they keep, uh, there is death penalty there. And also, of course, the killing of the Kashyapchi was a, a major news of the last year. And um, death penalties, for example, 37 Saudis just on April 23rd were executed. And they have no respect for human life. A bunch of thugs and criminals uh, imposing their will on people. They are not elected people. They don't follow God's laws. God says their, their business, their affairs is based on consultation. Their election is consultation. You cannot be saying my father is this and that. Therefore, I have the right to lead you, that is tyranny. According to Quran, it is the Pharaoh's way. And therefore there are Pharaohs, but unfortunately they use God's name, they use Islam, which they have nothing to do with Islam. 
Uh, here it is, uh, I want to share with you the list of World Happiness Report, the happiest countries according to some criteria about distribution of wealth, about education, about healthcare, and uh, freedoms, and all those factors. Finland is uh, in 2020 was considered number one overall total. Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Norway, the Netherlands, Sweden, New Zealand. Look at the names. Not a single so-called Muslim or Mushrik countries, those who, yes, confess to be Sunni or Shiite country. New Zealand, Luxembourg, Austria, Canada, Australia, UK, Israel, Costa Rica, Ireland, Germany, US, Czech Republic, Belgium. These are the top 20. Though I have uh, uh, an objection to a few of them, Switzerland, I think the happiness in that country is uh, also basically partially due to their criminal uh, banking uh, system, which they are harboring. Uh, they give a safe haven for criminals, big dictators, biggest thieves in the world. When they steal their money, they uh, basically deposit they're stolen billions of dollars in that country's banks. Therefore, Switzerland, I would like to reduce their number, their, their rank from the rank. And uh, I have a footnote here. As far as for the others, they are usually fine. Of course, not, of course, not perfect. Israel, yes, uh, inside Israel, people might be happy in the scale right now shows 14th happiest country in the world, but they also create external hells around themselves to those who are not Jewish people, Palestinian people. Therefore, if their happiness is at the cost of millions of Palestinian people, I cannot rank it as the number 14. And the US also, yes, it could be happy, happiest in, among the top 20, but it's also one of the countries that has bombed uh, dozens of countries around the world and uh, killed millions of people from Korea to Vietnam, from Philippines to uh, Iraq to Latin America. Therefore, I should, they should not be granted, listed among the top happiest countries, at least this one. UK, they have some uh, dealings, uh, bad things going on with them. They do a little bit, uh, kind of secretly some stuff. And also if among these countries, they are weapon manufacturers and sellers, U UK, U Israel, United States is, are among the top uh, weapon manufacturers, therefore, I wouldn't really consider them among the top happiest people. Happy for what? For killing people from other countries. Okay, but usually these countries, they are eliminate Switzerland because of the corrupt banking system. Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Netherlands, Sweden, New Zealand, Luxembourg, uh, Austria, they are good countries. Okay, I want to go here. Okay, we have this one. Okay, I'm in the wrong place. Okay. okay. Let me get out of here. Uh, one more thing, I want to show you some pictures. Uh, before that, uh, I, I'm going to open for discussion. Christopher Campbell, welcome. He was uh, one of my students in uh, logic class, symbolic logic. I can't believe it, you made it here. A long time ago, now he's somewhere else. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> now Saudi Arabia, I want to go back to Saudi Arabia. It is imperative that the Saudi kingdom will go down to the history's trash, pile of trash. By the very, we should not 
um, we should not give credit to these people. We should not, they should not be accepted to United Nations. I have no idea why the United Nations allows the tyrants who do not even care about people's will be represented in the United Nations. Therefore, we should protest the representation of Saudi Barbaria and uh, with other authoritarian countries in the United Nations. I know you could say, well, this is real politics. There is no other way. And I think we should pass that. We should, uh, the world, uh, we need to go to much better direction than envisioned 100 years ago by United Nations. United Nations doesn't have really any much function in making peace in the world, in promoting peace. For example, I expect that United Nations try Bush, Cheney, Dick Cheney, and uh, Rumsfeld, these are three neocon who made up lies in order to invade Iraq, thereby killing one million people, and then afterwards leading to the creation of ISIS. And these criminals, bloody criminals, Bush, George Bush, Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, and their entourage, they should be tried by the criminal court. But we see no, they get away in even United States. Barack Obama was elected, and I expected this guy talking about justice and got even Nobel Prize, but did not indict these people, did not ask at least by the US courts, we should try these criminals. Just the opposite, went, hugged George Bush, got along and uh, having parties with this guy. And therefore we need to have awareness against warmongers, criminals, who are basically responsible for manufacturing a lot of weapons and destroying the world. Um, therefore my invitation is we, the people around the world, there are enough of us in every country, millions of us, in fact, billions of us, who wants a better world, who wants peace and justice in the world. We should transcend the borders, religious and nationalistic borders that divide us. We should stand against corrupt governments that are hijacked by big bloody corporations. And therefore, I do think that at least in many countries, 50% of the population are good people. I, I don't have much trust in humanity, by the way. I think uh, majority of humans are corrupt and bad people they, because they support the evil in their countries. When flag is waved by their leaders, they don't care whether they are right or not. They just get ready to go kill other people. But still, there is a good number of good people, righteous people in countries. And if we unite our forces, voices, I think we can become more uh, effective and change the system in our countries. And uh, finally, I just I want to... Thing. The Muslim world, so-called Muslim world, there are 57 countries around the world. They confess to be Muslims. They are in the worst shape. They are worse. They are in the bottom in many ways. In terms of treating women as equals, they are worse. They are misogynistic. When they get more religious, they become more oppressive against their uh, wives, their children, their daughters, their sisters. I have seen many people from those countries, women reaching out, saying they are beaten by their uh, uh, husbands or their brothers or fathers. These are anecdotal, but I know they when their government, they get more religious, you see the first victim of that is women and children. And they are behind in science and technology. You don't see much 
uh, the signs of intelligent life in these 57 countries. When you check patent issues in the world, you see hardly any activity. They are in different uh, age they live. And in terms of education universities, check the top 100 universities, you don't see them. When check uh, in terms of uh, um, distribution of wealth, you see they are the worst countries. Just these are all against Islam. They claim to be Islam, but they are the most kafir. Kafir means infidels or ingrate countries in the world. I listed those countries. If they are Muslim countries on earth, they will be Finland, Sweden, Denmark, those countries that I listed a few minutes ago. And they are also very oppressive. The character of people in the Middle East, Sunni or Shia, it doesn't matter, has multiple personality. When they are weak, they are slaves to the weak, to the powerful. They are flatterers and slaves. They become a herd for the powerful. And if they get a little bit of power, they are pharaohs, they are oppressors, psychopaths against those who are less powerful than them, weak. Therefore, the father figure in the house or the uncle, they oppress their women, their children, but when they go out, when they work somewhere, they become slaves to their superior. And this multiple personality, unfortunately, is a sick personality, creates one of the worst um, demographics nation in the world. And therefore they continuously generate dictators and psychopaths because it is multiple personality. Not multi, yeah, it is. And uh, therefore didn't, this needs to be changed. In the Western world, there is better psychology. Uh, first of all, freedom of expression, is uh, more cherished in the Western world because they experienced in medieval times uh, from witch hunt to inquisition, a lot of wars based religious wars, they took lessons. Therefore they wanted to get rid of religion from the government, beautiful decision. And uh, also they learned about racism. They have now more maybe uh, some doubt about if a politician waves a flag, they, they are more cautious than the other countries. And uh, therefore we see also less gl glorification of the government or state. In the backward countries, so-called 57 countries, government is glorified, is made holy. And therefore, people want to become heard, ra'aya of a leader. But in the Western world, mostly as a culture, government is considered as a uh, service and also dangerous beast, needs to be cautiously watched. And uh, I love the Constitution of the United States the founders of the United States, they were mostly philosophers, not dictators, psychopaths, not religious fanatics. Therefore, when they designed the United States Constitution, they were well aware of the power of the state, the problem with the state, with the dictatorship. Therefore, they said, state is a beast. Government is a beast. We need to divide it, this beast like a monster into three heads so that we needed, unfortunately, these beasts to live together. But if, if it is one without check and balance, they can become very powerful and take away individual rights. In order to protect individual citizens from this government, we need to divide the government into three pieces, a monster with three heads. Therefore, those heads, they will be competing with each other, check and balancing each other. 
It will not be the most effective government. In fact, it will be less effective, but it is good because at least. And also we need citizens have their weapons. The second amendment, in case government turns to, despite this division of three branches, government become, the, the government become dictatorship, then the citizens should be able to uprise against the tyranny. And I really admire them. They, are, they were very thoughtful, wise people, the founder of this country, though they have their own, of course, deficiency. I'm not glorifying as my great ancestors, but uh, they, they were much ahead of many of their contemporaries, therefore. Uh, but in Muslim worlds, you see when someone become a leader, the rest of the people, they worship and they glorify the state. Like in Turkey, I want to fi finish with this one. In Turkey, they glorify Fatih Sultan Mehmet. In fact, they give the name of Sultan Mehmet to big mosque in Fatih, in Istanbul, or bridge, new bridge, Sultan Mehmet bridge. It's a glorified figure in Turkish history, but he was a killer, a baby killer. He was a psychopath, paranoid psychopath, a criminal with no merit. He, what is his job? What he did? He aggressed, he attacked a city which barely had defense, did not have even a military, basically invaded, captured, conquered that city, killed many people, and the soldiers raped many Christians. And these guys, for his own throne, killed by uh, suffocating his two years old brother. In fact, he got fatwa from religious leader, Shayful Shaitan, Shayful Islam they call, Shayful Islam issued a fatwa, said it is okay to kill your two year brother in order to save the state. The state is glorified. Goodness sake, you cannot kill to your baby, all your baby, to sacrifice for God, but state is bigger than God. In order to save state, well, state become equivalent of the throne of the psychopath. Basically, I am the state, this throne is the state, is glorified, is greater than God. Therefore, we should be able to kill babies because that baby brother, 10, 15, 20 years will grow and may become a rival against me, challenging me, and I am the state. This mentality, unfortunately, it is in the religion of Sunni religion. In the Sunni, in, in the faith of Sunni religion, is there are there are bases for this kind of fatwas because it comes from Umayyad dynasty, criminal, murderous dynasty. And they were, they killed many, many Muslims, Muslims in their time. They oppressed them like uh, Imam Azam, this, supposedly the Imam of uh, Hanafi sect. He was not, but he was, he, because he followed the Quran alone, he rejected Hadith, the fabricated stories about Prophet Muhammad. He was declared to be heretic during Umayyad Empire. And he was imprisoned. Then during Abbas Empire, he was imprisoned. And he died in in prison. Later, because he was also folk hero among monotheists, that time still among the people there were many monotheists. They were not Sunni or Shiite. They didn't follow Hadith or Sunnah. They followed the Quran alone. And therefore, they want to hijack, co-opt his name, and then they created, fabricated a sect called Hanifi sect. Uh, Yusuf, Imam Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, they are fake, evil people, and they created this sect. According to this sect, Hanafi sect, if the leader, the leader of the country is oppressive, is killing people, is stealing, still you have to obey the leader. This is, this has nothing to do with Islam, just the opposite of what Islam says. I want to stop here and open discussion uh, for you guys, whoever would like to talk. Please uh, raise your hands. Uh, do, you, do you know how to raise your hand? Blue hand. Uh, in the bottom, there is a, a more. 
in the bottom menu on the right side, more. If you click on more, you will see raise hand, blue hand on Zoom. Anyone with, want to talk? I would appreciate if you did, it is easier to manage because I may not see you there. Okay, Osmanaj, you're not able to raise your blue hand, electronic hand. Okay, I will give you, uh, go ahead. Um, the rest, please try to learn to raise your blue hands in All the right. menu. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you for inviting me here, Edip. Uh, I wanted to ask the question if there are is a specific new news to Hassan Farhan Al Maliki. Are they waiting for the judgment, or is it one hundred percent sure that he's going to get the death penalty? Do you have any new information on that topic? I personally, I'm not journalist. Honestly, I don't have information. Recently, I have been very busy with uh, our uh, business. We have a startup, technology startup, Beltways. Therefore, I moved to another state to work with the engineers. Mm. And therefore, I just heard the news recently and I wanted to bring to the attention. In fact, I am uh, expecting someone who will know better, but right now he's been tried. They want to um, kill him. And uh, I will try to you know, communicate with the people around the world to have more awareness about this issue, to pressure Saudi Arabia. We may also uh, gather signature to pull the attention of the United States government. At least Biden gives lip service to human rights. Uh, at least we need to put pressure, public pressure on them too. Yeah. But we cannot let Saudi Arabia get away by killing people. You know, Dr. Rashad Khalifa, Yes. Uh, I, he was killed after Saudi Arabia in 1989 uh, organized a conference in Medina under the leadership of Bin al-Baz. Yes. And uh, let me see, I have, in fact... Um, he got a fatwa. Then. Yeah, uh, let me see. Uh, this is uh, some... Okay, I need to move this one somewhere else. Uh, how can I? Okay, here. Uh, I want to find that. Uh, yep, yeah, this was about this cover story of Nocta magazine. This was about uh, fatwa in uh, from 38 countries, religious leaders. They gathered in Medina for Salman Rushdie, and then they issued a fatwa after the Salman Rushdie uh, controversy. They said Rashad and Rushdie, both of them are apostate, means they should be killed. Mm. And uh, this was the Fukra. Uh, El Fukra was supported by Al Qaeda, indirectly was uh, related to Saudi Arabia. There are several characters, one of them, Bilal Phillips, was the student of Bin Baz, and he was also a, a influential figure in that uh, fatwa. Within a year, they killed uh, Rashid Khalifa. And 19 the years that, later, they found the killer. Yeah, the killer was uh, found in Canada 19 years later. Yeah. Here it is this news week, uh, January 14, 2002 issue. It is about the killing of Rashad Khalifa, that the two mastermind behind 9-11, they were in Tucson. Three of them, in fact, was in Tucson. Two of them, they, was, they were directly involved with the killing of Rashad Khalifa. And here it is, uh, the, here, Al Haq, he was the one, uh, uh, mm. is the killer of Al Khalifa. Here is Rashad Khalifa, his name, this is mentioned. And, but United States was the one who also uh, allowed this happen. 
I have uh, almost 100% evidence that FBI and United States government was uh, complicit in this murder with Saudi Arabia. They let them get away with this murder. Mm. And uh, okay, I want to close this one. Okay, uh, I don't know right now. I don't know, but uh, first of all, I think Saudi Arabia would, would not be able to get away with these atrocities yeah. uh, without the support of the United States uh, corrupt government. Mm. Therefore, we need to pressure in the United States, our governments, we need to expose their crimes yeah. and uh, to people, majority of people, unfortunately, in the United States are not aware about this kind of uh, international deals going on. Mm. Even Khashoggi was killed, he was butchered in Turkey, and it was 100%, it was clear, it was under the order of Bin Salman, but nothing happened to this guy. In fact, Donald Trump uh, had meetings with him and supported him. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not acceptable. That's right. Anyone else would like to have uh, any ideas about this issue? I know I am uh, mostly complaining, but I think that we should not stay idle. We should not underestimate our powers as uh, individuals, uh, because these governments, they get power from our inaction, that we underestimate our power, we overestimate them, therefore we let them get away with those crimes. And hopefully we will create uh, a kind of unified voice in the world to promote peace and justice in this planet Earth. We cannot have a world where uh, all sorts of atrocities committed without any consequences. Anyone else uh, would like to talk? Hey, Adip, I want to ask you a question. This is Ali. Yes, Ali, come on. What is it? Do you have last name, Ali? Yeah, I just joined you about uh, 10 minutes ago. Sorry, I missed some part of it. I had a meeting. Okay. So I just Where are you from, Ali? Where What's are you that? calling from? Where are you calling from, Ali? North Carolina. Okay. Oh, you are Ali. Oh my gosh, now I think. Of course, you are my close friend. I didn't recognize you now. Yeah, that's fine. I'm getting older. Yeah, you're right. No, for a long time, we haven't uh, communicated uh, via video. We talked. Go ahead, Ali. So you gave some examples from history about uh, uh, how we, the East produces psychopaths. And now I just mentioned Salman, Mohammed bin Salman. This is our contemporary time. So we are continuing producing psychopaths for some reason. Do you think this is the real causes are political or cultural as well? Uh, to what extent really we can influence our own culture? We can change culture. It's very hard. We can change politics, of course. We can establish new institutions, maybe to some extent liberalize ourselves and be more democratic, etc. But how can we influence our own culture not to produce psychopaths like him or like others? Yeah, that yeah so I don't think... Right? It never stops. We just produce psychopaths. There is something wrong with that as well, maybe. What's your yeah. opinion on this? I do agree with you. I think the issue is not just political. It's not up from the top. The problem is from the bottom. People are ignorant and people are under the influence of a very horrible culture and which is influenced by religion. And uh, this needs a reformation. And uh, without reforming themselves, people, without changing their culture, they will always be producing psychopaths because they will not be appreciated they will not be appreciating righteous, honest people because they are themselves corrupt. They are themselves liars. And they are themselves uh, uh, oppressors. If they get power, people, people who are oppressed right now in Saudi Arabia, majority of them, or in Turkey, when they get power, they become oppressive because 
their culture is unfortunate that therefore we need to change that in order generation by generation it should not continue that cycle i just of course there are very good people but they are minority unfortunately i don't think that it is top down the problem but whether it's possible to change it top and then from top down change the culture it might be one way going but for a while maybe a benevolent dictatorship <laughs> to impose some uh, changes uh, mustafa kemal atatürk was one of them in turkey he came when people really they didn't uh, appreciate majority of people democracy or republic but uh, he kind of used authoritarian ways to tell people hey you need to have vote you should be deciding your own destiny your country not sultans corrupt sultans basically he he forced this on people and it was not really digested and here it is after about 100 years later we end up with a religious bigoted corrupt uh, fascist uh, uh, government in turkey because those people right now some of the people in turkey millions they want back the ottoman times they want a king on their top they don't deserve they they think they are aya this uh, um, what was his name uh, recep tayyip erdogan he was my former friends we were together in the same neighborhood in the same party in fact uh, one time we were arrested together because he joined one of my meetings uh, rallies and this guy in 2016 14 november 2016 i don't remember this date because it's to me is very important for many people may not be and uh, 14 november 2016 in aksaray his mansion which he it is the biggest mansion in the world 1150 rooms imagine the united states uh, uh, white house has 132 rooms erdogan much smaller country much poorer country uh, 1150 rooms he had there was a conference on agriculture and uh, animals what's called any agriculture and livestock conference and he said this to people there were about 1000 people his ministers member of congress top mayors leaders there he said i am a shepherd and you are my herd that i am grazing ben bir çobanın siz güttüğün rayamsınız first he insulted prophet muhammed through a fake hadith fabricated years later uh, in order to justify this kind of relationship between leader and people. That leader is a shepherd and people are herd, means a sheep, cow, donkey, and those kinds of things. And he said that all these people over there, some of them ministers, some of them uh, member of Congress, they all applauded him. Unbelievable. He first insulted Prophet Muhammad by narrating a hadith. The hadith says, all of you are um, shepherds and you are responsible from your herd. Of course, he's the top shepherd. He's not the herd of anyone. He says, I am the top shepherd and you are all of me. Now, and people accepted this humiliation. The Quran says, Pharaoh oppressed them and uh, subjugated them, demeaned them, and they accepted this humiliation. They became dishonorable people. Therefore, though the Quran is critical of Pharaoh, at the same time criticize the slaves who accepted that kind of relationship. And this is the mentality in the so-called Muslim world. From Umayyad Empire, that people says we are we are sheep and the king or the leader is the shepherd that mentality needs to change
Yes, Ali. I know that uh, this is not you wanted to talk. Perhaps uh, sometimes I may put you in a um, difficult no. situation. Uh, you are not responsible of these words. I'm saying, no, no, but that's great. Uh, I, yeah, you are academician. You are much more reserved in your words. Therefore, uh, you didn't have any anything in these things. Uh, if you no. are. That's wonderful. I appreciate your answer. You, you know, I'm, I come from the same culture. I come from the East. I'm a Muslim. I'm concerned about my religion, the way it is getting developed further, etc. I want my people know the truth. But my point is that it's very hard now to explain what the truth is, right? Now, for example, how many people you can really change their opinion about habits? It's an example. Very little. Maybe you can speak, spend your entire life to convince only a couple of thousand people because it's in their, their mindset is formed in that particular way, right? Uh, yes. That's unquestionable. Now today, Hadiths, for example, are to most of the people, most of the Muslims more important than the Holy Quran. That's the point. The second is that, now I know you are a great advocate of reading Quran, but people cannot read. Most of the Muslims cannot read the original version of Quran, right? They don't speak Arabic. They got to rely on others' interpretations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those people, as a matter of fact, they rely on hadiths or those kind of stuff. The old scholars, the new scholars who bring new versions of interpretations of Quran, they are not acceptable by many because then they are. Uh, announced as deviants or apostates, and they are subject to, uh, you know, punishment, right? Sometimes brutally, as in Russia Khalifa's, Khalifa's case. That's why I'm saying that that's part of our culture now, culture, Eastern culture, right? It is really hard to change, whatever you do, because many people, especially political institutions, do uh, benefit from them, right? From that kind of support because they are fed by them to perpetuate their uh, authoritarian, uh, say, power, etc. I see all of the yeah. Muslim movies, you cannot find a single true democracy, right? Like you speak about Turkey and you are critical of Turkey, I know often, but Turkey, imagine, is the best of the Muslim countries, what we have, right? More or less democracy you can find over there. The rest is the see all of them. So my, that's what I'm saying. How to bring up a uh, change over there? We cannot impose change from the West, right? West goes there with its own values and with its own interests. See Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya, etc. right? So we cannot expect remedy from the West. It cannot make this problem more complicated, etc. But we cannot bring change from inside. We tried, right? Like Arab, Arab Spring, although well, the West was there anyway, but again, we ruined everything. So that's what I'm saying. How can we bring about positive change? Is the education, one of the, the participants put there a very nice comment. I saw education is very important, but what kind of education again? Okay, yes, education is very important, but what type of education? Who defines about the really benefits of the education that we, we apply in, in our countries in the, in the East, in the Islamic world? I, I, I'm not saying I'm not optimistic, I'm positive. Still, I'm not pessimistic, but I see that problems are really deep rooted. That that to uproot them, to resolve them, gonna be really hard. But we shouldn't stop. You are. Right. There is change. Uh, let me tell you, I am very optimistic. These are the last uh, years of this uh, kind of religion. It will not survive. They are dinosaurs. They have to get away. And uh, for example, in Iran, the number of people, young generation who became deist or atheist is huge. There are millions of atheists right now in Iran and this. The same in Turkey, the number of people, the young generation who become atheists or deist or rational monotheists like us is increasing day by day. There is incredible momentum right now. Therefore, I think there is a threshold point. For example, the message of Quran alone Right now, it is growing. It's getting a lot of uh, uh, positive re reaction and acceptance from young generation, from people who think, who read. And it is growing. And they feel that the established, corrupt 
religious uh, imams and clergymen. You, for example, in Turkey, there are more than 100,000 uh, religious clergymen get paid by the government. They have luxurious life, good life, doing nothing except five times going to the empty mosques and just leading people for nothing, it's like exercise. And all they do promote ignorance and superstitions and promote the government. Whatever the government, this Diyanet İşleri Başkanı, the Turkish religious affairs, with more than 100,000 uh, members, they get uh, about equivalent of the budget of this religious organization, which is supported by government, is more than five ministries. Five ministries in Turkey, ministries like Secretary of, let's say, Education, Secretary of Agriculture. It is more than five ministries, the budget. And this money is spent of what? To make people more ignorant, to promote superstitions and lies, and uh, also to promote corruption. They have been supporting this government, which is the biggest thief. They plundered Turkey. They created incredible uh, uh, debt uh, kind of uh, in, in Turkey. They, they oppress, they filled prison with tens of thousands of people because they don't uh, believe it, they don't support their system, corrupt system and very oppressive, and, uh, but it is going to change. And this government is going to go because they destroyed the whole economy. They stole billions and hundreds of billions of dollars, and, uh, but they're going to go. And then after that, there will be more a reasonable government, hopefully people now fed up with religion. They know that religion is opium of masses. It's worse, it's basically, uh, I am, uh, of course, uh, I am talking people who do not know me. They think I am atheist. No, I have in fact written a Turkish book, 19 questions for atheists, 10 questions translated, this one. And this is uh, my kid's picture I put there because we were reading books anyway. And uh, I am not atheist. I have translated the Quran into two languages, English translation of the Quran, Quran reformist translation. Uh, it has been since 2007, and Turkish translation, message, message, since 1990, more than 30 years. And uh, I have no doubt about God's existence. I know that the Quran was our word of God. Jesus, Moses were God's messengers. And I am able to provide my evidences for this, extraordinary evidences. But at the same time, I am against religion being in the government, absolutely. If it is not secular government, it will be a corrupt, oppressive government. Thank you very much. You be, stay here, please. I really, I'm so glad to see you, Ali, here. And uh, I would like to talk to you even after this one. I, we haven't talked for a long time. And uh, Christopher, would you like to, uh, to join me? Uh, anyone else would like to please talk? Please raise your hand. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I guess, yeah, I, I guess um, I, I partially had a question as far as as far as what what solution we would want to see happen. I mean, you, you you've talked about pulling out of having the UN um, kind of reject some of these countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, but I mean, and, and it makes sense, but the concern would be um, if there is supposed to be some type of active influence that we should be having, um, how do we do that if we're cutting ties with the leaders of these countries, aside from possibly doing some of the, the shadier and, and horribly ineffective things that we've, or possibly too effective things that we've done in the past uh, in the US, um, like funding, um, you know, separatist groups within the government and things like that, which only leads to greater chaos. Okay. Thank you. 
And uh, I don't want to have uh, right now much talk and uh, I want people discuss. You are welcome to join further, uh, make comments and objections. Yusuf, it is yours. Um, go ahead, Yusuf. Right. Oh, there we go. I was uh, muted there. Uh, yeah, um, on the discussion of uh, the Middle East and the issues uh, with the sects and uh, the, the societies over there, I think a lot of it has to do with the ingrained culture that exists over there. And one of them, obviously, this is formed probably from the... Uh, the sectarian religions that have existed there since the Umayyad times, you know, oppressive rulers, sultans, and so on, uh, that that do all sorts of things, killing, killing people in those days who spoke freely, taking slaves from from North Africa up to Syria, up to Persia, even, and oppressing the locals there and suppressing freedom of religion, even in those days. You you still basically see those patterns existing now even going back to the Umayyad times. And uh, there's a kind of Stockholm syndrome that exists uh, in Turkey and even in the Arab countries that people are praying for the Ottomans to come back. And uh, were they living in the times of their ancestors? They, I don't think they probably would. Even in my own family, my family was even fighting the Ottomans uh, within Jordan and they decapitated some of our tribe leaders uh, near the current Amman fortress uh, because of, you know, they was forcing taxes on them and uh, conscripting them into the army and oppressing them. You know, you, they, they like to live free. Uh, everybody likes to live free, as all people around the world do, not even just Muslims. We're all human beings at the end of the day. But on the uh, point of the societies and the kind of... Uh, I'd say fetish almost they have for dictators, be it Saddam Hussein, be it MBS now in Saudi Arabia or uh, uh, the others throughout the world. I think uh, throughout the Middle East, I think the biggest issue is, is that um, starting off with their family unit and how families work over there. So um, the heads of the family, usually the father or in a, in a larger sense, the heads of the family, like a sheikh, the head of the tribe. You're not allowed to question them. It's very author authoritarian and their, their word is the law. And it's been like that even since the pagan Arab times, even going back to the time of the prophet and, and prior to that. And I think this thing that's ingrained within the family units and within the culture is probably one of the biggest things upwards with the sectarianism that they feed off each other. Like um, it's if if you can't even raise your voice to say your opinion in your own family because oh uh, my father's word is law like you have here in Europe you can question your parents you can say oh this I don't agree with this maybe this is racist maybe this is uh, this is uh, against human rights over there you can't say it because it's whatever the head of the family whatever he said that's the law and if and if you don't agree with that you get curtailed and you'll uh, You'll have problems and you'll be silenced and you'll it's like you're having uh, you're having an enemy within the family unit against it and it you know they say everything starts at home everything starts at home so if you're working upwards you know from home to the schools to the teachers to the teachers to the the people who work in the ministries the ministries and then to the government it it all starts at home really is my take on it I think things are improving. I am hopeful, although as bleak as it looks out there, it is quite bad. But from what I've seen with globalization and with social media, the world's a smaller place now and people are finding uh, new ideas all the time. YouTube's a fantastic resource, even where this is streaming today, as are many things. Books are widely available. We're not really in the times of the Umayyads when, you know, you bet you didn't even have newspapers back then and you couldn't really know what else is going on in the world or different provinces, different ideas. It was very centrally controlled. The thing is now uh, with social media, with YouTube, with books and things, the more readily available, it's, uh, it's much easier to see the alternate opinion. Although you may be living under an oppressive regime, at least there's that conversation taking place and, you know, seeds here, seeds there. It's like, uh, it's like a, 
a boulder rolling down a hill, really, or a snowball, it gets bigger and bigger as it goes. It's my take on that. Yes, Yusuf, you said your ancestors were Jordanian. I thought that your mother's side is British. Yeah, on my mother's side, yeah. she's British, but on my father's yeah, therefore, side... Yeah, therefore, you could say half my ancestors were in Jordan, the other half, they were in India as a uh, kind of colonialist, something like that. Hmm. <laughs> the mother's side. Yeah, like on, on, my, uh, on my father's side, um, actually... Um, they were in conflict with the Ottomans and they joined the, the Arab revolt that the British uh, brought to the region. But the British later re re redacted on the promises to have a state uh, running on that. And then that, you know, obviously the sykes pico agreement after that, which created a lot of the issues they have in that region today with the borders uh, and things like that. But um, yeah, um, one of our... Uh, one of our relatives is known as uh, Saleh al-Hadid. He was fighting with the Ottomans in Amman and uh, they lured him uh, to a meeting. They say, we want to discuss with you some things like, uh, and in those days there was kind of a chivalry. Like uh, when people said, come to a meeting, you didn't like come with weapons drawn. It was supposed to be, you discuss it. And then after that, if you had, you had the battle, you'd have a battle. But in that moment they beheaded him and then, uh, our family joined the Arab revolt, basically. And that's look at this, yeah, look at this uh, hypocrisy of racists. The Turkish racists, they accuse of Arabs of revolting against Ottoman Empire. Mm. They were betrayer, prisoners. They backstep us. I've heard well, that. But they fight against the oppressor, the invaders. It is okay. It is the war of independence. It is glorified war. It yeah. is it is great holy war. But Arabs, they must accept their oppression and their kingdom, their colonialism. It's so incredible. That's, true, Arabs that, would, that's a very yeah, good point. Though. If yeah. Arabs had invaded their country and became their sultans, <laughs> against Arabs, revolting against Arabs, according to them, is a great thing. It is holy. But the opposite, they cannot think. Basically, human, we should be thinking whatever I think for myself or should I be thinking for your, for you? What is good for me exactly, should be yeah. good for you too. Exactly. But there is incredible selfish, subjective, very biased expectations. This is an evil culture. It means uh, racism in this and, sense. And uh, funnily enough, in the Middle East now, there's a Stockholm syndrome with it, uh, with the whole Ertugul, uh, El Tugrul series and the Ottoman glorification things that exists. And uh, it's, uh, I feel there's a certain element that is promoted from, from over there to promote this kind of Ottoman stuff and things like that as the glory days when we was great. I mean, I, I wouldn't really see them as glory days. I mean, even the train line, which today is... That's one of the, you know, if you discuss with Ottoman uh, people who are in favor of them, they'll say, oh, well, they built the train line to, uh, towards Mecca to let pilgrims and come. First and foremost, this was a military installation so they could supply all areas of the empire with soldiers and weapons and keep all the provinces under control. If there's a revolt in the Hejaz, they go and crush it quickly because they have easy access. Secondly, it was for pilgrims, but uh, like it, it was multi-use, but the... You know, it was mainly a military installation. It's like if the British came and installed the same thing and says, oh, yeah, we want you to get to Mecca easily, but they're, they're moving soldiers and ammunition shells on the same train line as the pilgrims, you'd question, what is this train really for? And, uh, you know, I guess just a tool to keep things in, in control, really. Okay. Joseph, those who are uh, longing for Ottoman time, they, they think their ancestors, they were in palaces. No, 99, more than 99% of people in the Ottoman time, they were subjects, they didn't have rights, they were poor, they were walking with clothes, with patch clothes, they were basically forced, uh, a lot of uh, taxes they would pay. If they couldn't pay taxes, they would get killed. They didn't even have right to life, no, <laughs> no freedom. Yeah. Basically, I tell them your ancestors value 
in the eye of the Sultan was not better than the shit of his horse. Mm -hmm. the, the, your ancestors value because they called people you are my herd in fact you are my slaves kullarım they were addressing to people raya means my herd or kullarım my uh, slaves exactly like pharaoh mm -hmm. and I cannot believe these people now they want the glory of Ottoman psychopaths okay Ismail Ibrahim it is your turn thank you very much Joseph thank for you your joining Um, Salam, can you hear me? Salam, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay, um, I'm from Malaysia. I've been, uh, uh, well, I'm a Quran reader and, and researcher myself for a long time. And uh, this Zoom meeting, we were supposed to come up with some sort of solution on how to, uh, to redress the issue of, of persecution. Basically, this is a persecution of beliefs in Saudi Arabia, people being, being uh, incarcerated for, for their belief, principally. So, uh, this is my observation. Reading the Quran, people like us, is part of 6116, which mentions that we will be in the minority. Now, uh, so, Over the years, in Malaysia, we are also suffering the same uh, problem like in the Middle East, uh, in America, everywhere. The government is the one of the most corrupt government and they use race and religion as a tool to maintain their power. A uh, very convenient tool and very easy. And, and by culture, People of Malaysia, uh, if you go back centuries, we have always been lived. Uh, we have always been living under uh, a feudal, feudal uh, kind of uh, lifestyle uh, culture, where in a village we have the village chief, and next to him will be the second most important will be his treasurer, and then the third would be the religious teacher. Those days it was shamans and. Uh, And then with the influence of um, the Arabs, uh, the Yemeni traders, we converted to Islam in bracket, right? And, and, yes. and, and it became worse because now in our country, there is one class of people that are in absolute power without being elected into office. These are the muftis of each state. Muftis is uh, the, the, the, religion, uh, the leader of the religion, which is in, in Malaysia, officially it is Sunnism. Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Right? And, and you said this, it very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm quite okay. well versed in Arab. You know? <laughs> I've been reading uh, Quran a long time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, they are appointed into office. Uh, in Malaysia, unfortunately, Besides having the most corrupt government in the world, if you go to the international rating, you find it's right on top somewhere. Second, we have nine sultans. For such a small country, we have nine sultans. Uh, and the sultans is the head of the religion. Uh, of, of, of, of the religion. Uh, and they, he appoints the mufti. So the appointment of the mufti is by the sultans, not through the electorate process. Okay, that's one problem that we, we have been living with. Uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, our constitution was drafted by the British. So the, the, our federal constitution currently is in line with what, when we were independent in 1957, which was drafted by the British. So it is a very secular uh, constitution where there is separation of power and belief. There's no uh, uh, provision to include uh, beliefs in government. That's the principle of our constitution. But over the years, the corruption, as you say, that comes in to place and, and the dumbing down of the population, the, the Malays principally, Uh, 
that that that, um, that they now the constitution now has has been changed to say that um, that is uh, you know Islam this and that uh, being a Malay is to be an Islam blah blah blah to such an extent that now in our, my country we have this uh, term that I use uh, Malay supremacy. Which is equivalent to you know, white yeah. supremacy. Like white. So, now, uh, um, before I digress, what I see for myself, I'm, I'm quite a young guy, I'm about 66 years old, is that all of us here in this forum were born after Second World War. I can assume that, right? After yeah. 1940. So, what happened after Second World War? We, uh, was uh, putting in place of a template by the imperialists that won the war. So the imperialists then were basically America, Russia, uh, the powers that be at that time. They were the ones who created the template, the United Nations, uh, all this, uh, basically United Nations, this and that. And they, um, there was a, this period of Cold War, the nuclear deterrent period, right? And these imperialists are the ones that created the template that we all adopt. So the way I was educated the, uh, from small, I had to go to primary school, secondary school. Then I went to university in England, blah, blah, blah. I became an engineer, are all the result of adopting this template under that, that time is UNESCO education, right? So the United Nations is the tool that the imperialists use to promote uh, uh, and maintain their power. Now, my observation, I could be wrong. Uh, for example, in America, whoever becomes the president is immaterial. Uh, both sides are uh, controlled by another entity, another level, right? Uh, now, uh, who gained from the Second World War? Who gained? Uh, a lot of people died, right? Millions of people died. American soldiers died. Japanese died. Germans died. Russians died. Millions. But there is an entity that gained. These are the bankers. The funders, they back, they, they funded both sides. Uh, England, after the Second World War, find, found that they were in such a lot of debt that the pounds, at that time it was the, the world currency, lost its strength. Then it subsequently was overtaken by the US dollar, right? Because they were in debt to finance the war. And part of the debt was paid by resources that they got, they took from this part of the world, rubber, tin, and all that, you see? So, as an, this is my observation. So these people, uh, this entity uh, who controls, who has the real control, basically, for my reading, is the guys who own the banks. Banks, multinationals, whatever. Like, who owns federal retail? Who owns yeah. federal retail? Yeah, I, yeah I, sorry. Please uh, wrap it up in one minute. Uh, is yeah. Me. So, so we we are fighting these people to to to change uh, the balance, so to speak. But uh, in in in the meantime, this this noise out of me, you know, I'm a hum, human being. Uh, I use the Quran as my guidance to maintain my inner peace. So that despite all this noise around me, I do not lose my focus. And my focus is as a human being in this three dimensional existence that I'm going through now, my mission is to learn. Learn and learn and learn. And build as much, as much knowledge. Now, if if we want to try and um, change Saudi Arabia regime now, they are funded by, uh, they, they are backed by, as you say, America and, and, and you know, for geopolitical reasons. The uprising of the Ottoman Caliphate 
in the Middle East now, the the, the uprising is actually backed by people like the Russians, who wants to balance the power of the Americans in Middle East. So this is what I see now. If we want to fight this system, uh, we are the minority. Six one one six. I, I, Thank I you, uh, Ismail. Uh, I uh, yeah, what we got uh, from you, you think that uh, it is uh, after World War II, the bankers, uh, the corporations, they basically no, World War One, yeah. the Napoleonic War. It goes yeah. back. It yeah. Go back into the, during the yeah, I know, uh, but uh, uh, today, when we come today, banking system is uh, different than. Hundred years before, right now they have they use the laws, they are, they have corporate laws, they design, they also have uh, uh, how do you say election campaign contributions, lobbies. Uh, it's a whole new system. Yeah, reserve uh, bank, all this stuff. Thank you. Is, yeah, is money uh, Yeah, I, I know this is a, it is a big issue, but I look at it. I think we are in a different time, and the internet is a different factor yes. than before. I agree, and I agree. of course, internet also creating echo chambers. Uh, mm. Ignorant people find each other; they get uh, support from each other. They all kind of conspiracy theories are crooked. All mm. kind of lies can be in echo chamber magnified, and people think it is true because everyone in that little universe they say the same thing. There is that kind of side effect, but at the same time, it opens the possibility for people to reach information. And right, of course, right. those who also own money, they want to manipulate this media. And of course, we know that Facebook or Google is uh, uh, utilized by the government. Uh, I, I don't need to read news or secret information to know that Facebook and Google primarily, they serve the government, they work in cahoots to provide uh, information, sell government private information, people's relationship activities. But at the same time, we can utilize it uh, to be a powerful positive force and will be, I do believe so. The current and, uh, COVID, COVID thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's an example, the current COVID issue. You know, now people are putting foreign uh, vaccination Blah blah blah, but when you go go back into history, the germ theory is the basis of this vaccination. But there is flaws in the germ theory. So depending on how far you want to go back, the information is there, right? Yeah. Before the germ theory, people cure themselves other ways, you know, by wellness. So for example, the Chinese had their own medicine, the Indians had their own medicine, and they they didn't have germ theory then, you know. They they look at chi energy whatever. But it worked. So uh, you think uh, uh, you think there is no there are no germs? There are there are germs, but this uh, for for me example, right? I look at it this way: uh, we are being stop being human is one thing. So you have things like social distancing, which is an oxymoron in English. How can I social socialize with you? I'm at di at a distance. So the human animal uh, that God created, right? We are created perfect. We have always been ahead of the virus. Our body is made up of single cell microbes, bacteria. And because we have bacteria, we have, uh, we have viruses in us, the product of cell breakdown. So, uh, but many people uh, are not into in that analysis, no? so they, they look at the media, mainstream media, they, they, they get scared, fear. Fear is the power that they use. And when you're fearful, you end up policing your neighbor. You see, so they don't have to use police. You yourself, you become like a sheep. It's a very Orwellian kind of Thank scenario. You. Thank you, Ismail. I uh, appreciate Good. it for your comments Good. and beautiful. Okay, anyone else uh, before closing this uh, meeting? Um, okay, Amin, go ahead.
Go ahead. Okay, yeah, so. Okay, so now I'm going to have to You know, I'm, I am, um, you know, the, you know, I was texting with with Adip before. This is a very good cause, and and you know I want to support it, you know, in however way I can. Now, um, you know, I myself am not in a position of power, or um, I'll admit I, I'm not even like as knowledgeable about the subject as as you know other people. But you know. Um, at the same time, I don't want to use that as an excuse to not do anything. So, um, you know, that's why I believe it's like, you know, whatever you can do, you have to do. And if you're not able to do something, then for the time being, then at the very least support other people that are that that are in a position of more connections and resources to, to do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so far, just for that reason, I've been silent. Um, I, I really don't have much to say, but um, but before we end the meeting, I just uh, you know I just want to you know say that and and you know make sure that it, if anything, I'm always acting as a good support for stuff like this because I think that organizations and associations like this, where you know you have a bunch of positive people, and that no matter whatever your ideology is, your number one goal is peace and stuff. I think it's actually rare to have that in not only in theory, a lot of people say, but in practice. So whenever you see people doing that, then my thing is always latch onto it and do everything you can to help because it's not something I take for granted. So before we leave, I just want to just say that and yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, where are you yeah. participating from? I mean, oh, um, South Pasadena. Okay. Uh, where is my yeah. name? Okay, I should do something. After my name, I am putting my country, U.S., Arizona, and uh, here it is. That's the best way to write your name. Okay. The, name, the abbreviation of the country, slash forward, without space, and then your city or county or state. Okay, Christopher, it is your turn. Yeah, uh, well, I just want to ask, because it's been really interesting kind of hearing some of these different perspectives from different places and, and people who are in those places. But uh, I, and and um, it's one thing that I've, I've heard before in, in some of the discussions that you've had before, uh, Ida, and, and I, I was wondering, because there seems to always be this contention between um, the idea of Eastern and Western culture um, when it comes to the Middle East. Um, and it seems it seems kind of uh, interesting to me because because they've they've throughout the history been so interconnected and interlaced, um, especially when it comes to to the ideas the ideas that built up the you know kind of the democratic West that that we see see now. Um, so much of that only survived because of um, Middle Eastern philosophers and and Arabic philosophers back in the day. Um, and I'm wondering when, when, when we're when we're approaching something like this, if if perhaps that connection, the connection to education and philosophy, between the East and the West, is um, is maybe is maybe where where we've lost it, right? You know, in the West, for sure, we we depend on on you know the things that came before us, you know, the philosophers and the and the idealists and that came before us that built up these countries, um, but we've lost many of those ideas. Uh, and and I'm I'm wondering if if in some of the the Middle Eastern countries if if that's not the case too, but just they didn't have they weren't able to build on on, on those ideas before uh, before I mean things went went south and I, I'm just wondering if that's where the connection is. Yeah, the possibly. same the same uh, in the Middle East uh, there were some very good uh, <clears throat> uh, movements. Like Ikhfan Safa or Mu'tazila, there was some uh, a group of uh, scientists and thinkers. They were much progressive. They were progressive, but uh, the corrupt uh, kingdoms, kings, they found that they saw them as threat to their corruption, to their oppression. 
like Socrates were found to be danger for the state, therefore he was tried and uh, killed. And the same with, the, with them. And there, there were very great minds uh, in medieval times, even after that. But uh, we need to change the, our, uh, honestly, the, the whole thing is about uh, religion. Religion became part of the culture. The Sunni religion is so, uh, sm uh, so kind of immersed in the culture of the people. Even atheists in Turkey, they, they are kind of very against religion, but they got as a culture some of the major evil uh, traits and characteristics. For example, they are also atheists in Turkey, not all of course, but many of them are oppressors themselves, authoritarian. And um, they are also against freedom of expression. For example, they, they are also support the laws that uh, criminalize uh, so-called insult, insulting, let's say, the president, insulting this great hero. They have their own sacred cows. And in order to protect sacred cows from criticism, they say, no, insulting that person should be criminalized. These people should be put in prison. Therefore, even atheists there, they don't have good idea about freedom. Their freedom is slanted towards their own selfish freedom, not for everyone, not the universal. Therefore, they are influenced by that culture. And you see some atheists in Turkey, they are as misogynist, as chauvinist, as the religious one. Therefore, the religion is so much for centuries influenced the culture of even those people who are not religious. This needs to be changed. In order to change, I think uh, people like Hassan al-Malik, uh, people like uh, Rashid Khalifa uh, should have freedom. We should support them. And I am one of them too. Thank God I have, I have survived so many death threats and fatwas. And uh, here it is, I want to, before closing, share with you, uh, where, where, where, where, where is it? Hmm. Okay. Somehow when I go to screen share, it doesn't bring the page uh, I want here. Okay, here. Hopefully now we will get this page. Um, I apologize, uh, Zoom has pr a problem. Okay, here it is. If you have access to 19.org internet, over there, click on Manifesto. You will see Manifesto for Islamic Reform online and also downloadable. Uh, it, you can download it and also have online, read it online. And uh, you can download from it for free. Uh, and also you can download the uh, Quran, a reformist translation on internet, academia and others, you can find it. And uh, please uh, read this booklet because here I compare the Hadith and Sunnah, teachings of Hadith and Sunnah with the teaching of the Quran. And here I have a table, I'm going to bring the table here. I'm going a little bit slow. Anyone who wants to read it may not have access to 19.org because my website 19.org is banned by partially in Turkey. And also I learned Catholic Church, the Pope has banned my website to Catholic institution. I learned it by accident. One of my students transferred to University of San Diego which is a private university run by Catholics. And then once he called me about a philosophy assignment, he consulted me about his assignment. I discussed with him and then I told him, I said, I have philosophy, some philosophy articles <clears throat> I have written on this subject, check19.org. And uh, a few minutes he called me back. He says, uh oh, it is censored, <laughs> it is blocked by university, which is a Catholic university in the United States. Unbelievable. And, but therefore uh, you can go through here. This is a table I compare the teaching of the Quran on the, uh, uh, okay. You'll be filled with most of This is Hadith 
and how it contradicts with the Quran on the right column. And I also provide reasons why this rule entered the sectarian teaching, the source of it or the motivation behind it. Anyway, this is a long thing. I don't want to keep longer here. And also I want to show you, do you see it here? Let me see whether you see it. Do you see what you see? Do you see Amazon.com? Yeah. Okay, here I put my name. This is Quran Reformist Translation, but you can have it PDF for free, Islamic Reform Free 19.org. If you type in uh, Google PDF free, you will find them. But if you want a book that's here, that is really, this is how many pages, this is about close to 500, 600 pages, pretty low. And this one is reduced to $2 and I'm going to buy my own book, Running Like Zebras. And um, these are, and um, this is a good book. And uh, this is Turkish Quran uh, translation. This is the latest one. Uh, anyway, I don't make money. I don't get royalty from my books on religion. This is my principle. And uh, these are some Turkish books. This is my life story in Turkish. I'm going to translate it. Uh, it's translated to English, but needs to be edited and published. These are some of the Turkish books. This is the 19 questions for atheists. 10 questions were translated into the English. And also from Malaysia, we had Qasim Ahmed. Qasim Ahmed, his book, Hadith, this one, Qasim Ahmed, Islamic Renaissance, A New Era Has Started. This is also a beautiful book. I uh, Let me see uh, Rashad Khalifa. His book, Quran, Hadith, and Islam, is a very important book. Uh, this is his translation. Uh, my translation is improvement of that translation. Uh, in many ways, but uh, Quran, Hadith, and Islam, where is it? Uh, I don't see it here somehow. Uh, that's interesting. That's a very important book, but you can find it as a, um, a PDF. Uh, what else I want to, let's say, <clears throat> Abdurrab. Abdurrab, he is a Harvard graduate, Dr. Abdurrab. Exploring Islam in, in New Light is a good book. And, uh, and also maybe, uh, sh nah. uh, anyway, I want to stop here. Okay, anyone else who would like to uh, say the last words before closing? By the way, Christopher, where are you now? Which state are you in? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Arizona as well. <laughs> Are you serious? You came back to Arizona? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I am right now in uh, Iowa. I moved to Iowa temporarily. I will be working here on our project. And it is snow here. Let me show you outside to know that. Do you see the snow? Outside. <laughs> Anyway, okay. Oh, we have Yusuf and Amin. Yusuf, first you, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, on the things we was talking, I think Christopher mentioned a really good point, uh, just to wrap it up, um, about uh, the philosophers in the Middle East and uh, the uh, top intellectuals in the time of the so-called Islamic Golden Age like Ibn Sina and uh, others uh, who pioneered uh, great fields in their time. Abu Rushd and, and Ibn Khaldun and uh, Abu Laiz, you remember? And, and uh, uh, uh, uh, Ismi. Haytham, yes. I think. And Haytham, well. yeah. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the biggest issues we're seeing now, the fallout from then until now, and the comparison with Europe, is Europe went through the dark ages and then they had their renaissance where it looks like we had we had the renaissance and went to the dark ages and we're still in the dark ages now in the Middle East. And I think 
in in my kind of prediction or analysis of it, I think that our renaissance for the Middle East will come, but it'll come um, as a result of uh, external influences like social media, rising education, globalization. You know, the world come in a smaller place and ideas exchanging like a, a virtual renaissance, if you will, rather than an internal one, as we saw in Europe back in the, uh, the Dark Ages. Well, uh, we, we just recently met, and I'm so glad to meet you, Yusuf, uh, from UK, uh, GB. Where is GB? What does GB mean? Oh, uh, Great Britain, but like, yeah. Goodness say, UK is enough, United Kingdom or Great <laughs> Britain. And uh, what is the city? Uh, Manchester. Manchester, okay, you're from Manchester. I should probably put that. Okay. Yeah. Let's pop that <laughs> nice okay. to meet you also, Edith. It's an honor. You're welcome. I'm glad to meet you. And uh, who else would like to? I mean, did you have something to add? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just before we go, so I shared in the chat, I think I shared one of them two times. I don't know if any of you have read it. So I shared a link on Amazon you, you can buy for me. I've read a lot of biographies on the Prophet Muhammad. That That is the only one I can take seriously. It is the only accurate one I have ever read. By uh, whom? It's my Juan By Ho. whom? He wrote it two years ago. Juan Ho. Uh, uh, I know. Yeah, Juan Ho. No, I haven't read it, but I like uh, uh, Leslie. You have to read it. I, I Listen, Leslie, have you read Leslie's? Yeah, I don't like it. First Muslim. Leslie Hazel. Yeah, I don't like it. Why? No, I've read that one. I don't. Why? You know, it's she has some good points, but still, there are a lot of mistakes she makes. Juan Cole is the one that every single, all of these controversial issues, he presents them um, very well. I mean, I can't explain a lot of the points you talked about. He also has similar things. Um, and and his his his website is also. I also gave a list. A link to his website but it is the one biography of Muhammad that as far as I know has zero mistakes I mean like maybe mm. there's this whole thing of whether you could say whether he was literate or not you can make small issues it is the for me I mean as far as I know it I've, I've not found a single mistake in it is it this is book spot on. it is beautiful Muhammad prophet yes. of peace amid the clash of empires you have to read it yeah, there's very. It's really rare to find an accurate biography. Well, that Cole has uh, has read my book, uh, Quran: A Reformist Translation, and also Manifesto for Islamic Reform. Really? Yeah, he, yeah of course. You know uh, yeah, we okay. know each other. Yeah. We met each other in a conference too. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but then, but then I gonna, I, I see like... it's politically is li a little bit kind of. Uh, mm. not very courageous. Uh, he wants to keep mm. maybe the company of some uh, sources. Therefore, I'm mm. not really much happy with him, but I haven't read his mm. book, but he's an, uh, more open-minded compared to all uh, sure. other uh, uh, clergymen. Yeah. Therefore, I'm sure. glad that you like it and I will check it, God yeah. willing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One call. Okay, thank you very much, people. Uh, I, it is beautiful, and hopefully we'll see each other other times. Maybe we will do frequently, not frequently, periodically, every week or uh, twice a month, bi-weekly. And would you like to join us all the time? And yes. I will share with you. Okay, that would be yeah, fantastic. Be yeah, we will just talk about more generally about the issues we... Uh, interpret what's going on or a topic that you want to talk let me know ahead of the time we can uh, discuss those issues i think we, we should have this forum uh, open for diverse people nice meeting you gentlemen thank Ali, you nice meeting you also. Uh, last you have anything to say before leaving as the last word ali askerov yeah i appreciate this kind of meetings i think <laughs> Uh, this kind of meetings would be helpful for everyone. And uh, this is a kind of uh, virtual socialization, on the other hand, which is also good. I'm looking forward to joining you again, Adib. Okay, God bless you. Thank you very much, people. Peace.